Okay, this was the last slide we, uh, we discussed. And these numbers should be fairly accurate. I'm not going to swear to them that they're exact, because most likely they're not. Uh, trends, they go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. Uh, I think right now we're in more of a downswing, especially I keep harping on AB 109. They revamped the penal code that took the pressure off the state prisons and put it in the county's own backyard. So the jail numbers could be higher, but the uh, prison population numbers have gone down. Okay, so jails, jail conditions. Uh, low priority item in the criminal justice system. And that's sad. <laughs> it really is. Uh, traditionally, jails tend to be overcrowded. The conditions are pretty bad. Uh, some of them have been modernized. The county's invested some money. But traditionally, they're, they're in bad shape. I can only attest to Kings County, uh, where I came from. And the old jail, thank God they built a new one. This thing was terrible. I mean, worse than some of the older prisons I've ever worked in. Uh, finally, they found enough money. They passed some bonds and they built a really nice state-of-the-art jail. Uh, it's clean, but it's still a jail. You know, holding tanks, it stinks, it reeks. You get these drunks coming in, and you know what people that are drunk do, right? Oh, they puke everywhere. It's, just, it's, it's a mess. You'd never want to go to jail. Rick, you have something to talk about? I think the most important uh, thing that's lacking in every single jail yeah. across the board yeah. is access to legal resources. Just like mean looks like the prisoner not suffer. a priority for them yeah i was just yeah. saying because as a pretrial yeah. detainee who has no experience with the law mm -hmm. you're incarcerated you're facing going to trial at least uh, one book in every pod should be mandatory not gonna happen and i'll tell you why great normally right you make some good points and right now this is one of them at a county jail most of the people that are going through the system they can care less. They're more concerned about making contact with their family, letting them know their situation, uh, trying to get visitors, trying to make arrangements for an attorney to come in. They're panicking. They don't even think about that. Yeah, I, I okay. think. Not until it's, until it settles in. Every once in a while, you get a legal beagle, and most of the time, they're recidivists. If they're a legal beagle, because they've been through the system more than once. Uh, first time through. Panic. Like it just panic. Uh, how many times have you been booked? One. How many bookings have I seen? Thousands. Okay. So you, Drake speaks from personal experience. You tend to be biased. Okay, because he's gone through it. I'm not. I've seen so many people in this situation. I can't speak for him because he's gone through the system, he's experienced it. I've only seen a thousand others like him go through the system. And that's what I'm talking about when I speak. Yeah. Not from personal experience. No, I, I know I'm the exception of the rule because yeah. a lot of people who came there had low education and low drive and as soon as the officer wouldn't pop them out to go to school, mm -hmm. they would just be like, fuck this because they wouldn't yeah. want to beat the shit out of the cop. Sometimes, deal with it. sometimes that's but misdirected that's, aggression. Yeah, a lot of them are just like, you know, I don't want to deal with that. I'd rather go work out on the yard. Uh -huh. But for me, I was very persistent I felt I was entitled to some sort of rehabilitation, mm -hmm. and that's what I felt. Entitled. Yeah, I mean, that's a good department of pressure rehabilitation. Entitled. God, I love that word. You're in jail or prison, but yet you have a sense of entitlement. I was pissed off because I was put there sure. defending myself. I yeah. got shot in the head. I had to defend myself right. again, and then I had cops in there yelling at me, and I had to defend One. myself for that. One experience. One, right? Thousands. I see. I shot people in the head. Not proud of it. Shot him in the ass. Shot him in the head. Shot him with rubber bullets. Shot him with buckshot. Never put a two, two, three round for somebody. Always wanted to. Never got the chance. One perspective. Just please keep that one in mind. Yeah, no, I that. Okay. Where thousands of perspectives that I've seen people go through. And yes, from your opinion, you're absolutely right. But it's minimal. Really, 
considering the, the totality of the population coming through. 20 years of experience, I think I've had two people that have approached me with legal law library concern. It is an issue. Uh, whether it's a right, I don't know. The court says it is if you're in active litigation. But if you're not, then it's a low priority. Okay, so let's get back here. Conditions are poor. Granted. County level administration results in lack of regulation. Yeah, also true. There are some regulations, but they're not enforced. Physical deterioration, absolutely. Uh, inmate sexual abuse survivors, a lot of times. And many jail inmates suffer from mental illness, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Whether the mental illness comes because of the drug use, or it's a mental illness that led to the drug use. But usually, if there's a mental illness, <clears throat> there's some type of a drug that's involved. But could even been the, the inmate themselves. It could have been the mom that ingested drugs during the birth. And this kid's born that way, and it's sad. So conditions, what single thing do you think could be done to improve jail conditions? So put yourself in a jail. You're there for the first time. What do you think would be the most important thing to you? Think about it. You're walking through. I know you have a lot of power wash. Power, you want to wash the cell? Yeah, it's just taking a power wash, going to the drunk tank, because, man, I've seen a homeless person drink out oh, of this. That's amazing. We actually had a drunk tank with pink elephants. We had an artist come in and drink pink elephants. They tore that wall down. But it was hilarious. Did you see a drunk come in? And they're, oh my God, they're, they think they're seeing things, but they're really there. I thought it was funny. Okay, so what do you think is important? You're a new arrival into the prison. What would you expect from your treatment? Anybody? Or now I'll start picking up. No, this guy here. Isaac, what do you think? You just walked in, you've got done being booked, they're escorting you to your cell. Right, so your access to it. Going to move things, make sure things. Just wait for him until the process. A legal team is important. That's what you want. I mean, for me personally, the condition that I said do what I want to do, I just want to make sure everything is all the legal aspects is taken care of. Okay. And what do you think? I think the same. I would probably like call my mom and be like, Mom, here's something, like, I'm in jail. Learn something and then like have her reach out to the other You want that phone call. Yeah. Most people, they want to reach out. They're trying to contact someone, either for help or to let them know of their situation. What do you think? I was going to say the same thing, a phone call. Phone call. As soon as I can. Good. Uh, that is one of the rights when you come through. As soon as you're booked, you're allowed to make the phone call. Make your phone call, uh, oh, whatever. <laughs> I had a guy call in for a pizza. What an <laughs> idiot. Yeah. I think cleanliness wise, I would just want a clean bathroom. Like a, a clean bathroom. bathroom. See, I, I found that with you. <laughs> uh, now, remember, when you go into the county for initial booking, you're not going to be taking it yourself. You're putting it in a holding tank, that's what he's talking about. And these holding tanks are filled with other, not that you're a degenerate, but other people in your situation, some repeat offenders. Uh, people of all size, all color. Uh, it's a strange environment. Okay. And yes, there's predators in there. Just looking for a young, tender piece of meat to walk through those bars to abuse you in different ways. How does that make you feel? Officer! <laughs> Officer, don't leave. I'm going to stay right here by the grill and watch everybody in this cell. Think about it. You're going to be praying, please take me to my cell. I want to go to a cell. Because you're in there with 10 other people. So you say, okay, good. Your wish is granted. They take you to a cell. But instead of being a single cell, you're going to a dorm. Instead of 10 people, now you've got 20 or 30 in this dorm. You kind of, here's your bunk. One's here, one's here. Oh, you get the triple bunk. Really? Well, thank you. 
it's not a pleasant environment. Some ugly people are going to be coming to you. Why are you here? What did you do? Who do you love with? Is he a big person? Ben's a big person. Okay, so it's a terrible situation, and hopefully none of you will ever find yourself in that situation. I raised three kids, scared all the time that they were going to do something stupid, and I was going to have to tell them, if you put yourself in jail, get yourself out, don't call me. I never had to enforce that, uh, because they never really did anything that bad to put them in jail. One of my nieces did. She did something stupid. I can't remember what it was. And my aunt calls me. She said, can you help me? Uh, Prissy is in jail. It was like a Friday night. I said, yeah, leave her there. She goes, oh, I can't. She's scared. No, nope, she put herself there. Monday, she'll be arraigned. Most likely, she'll be uh, let out on the war. She goes, well, thank you for the advice. Hung up the phone, called my dad, asked for money to post bail. Boy, was I pissed. He gave her the money. She went down, posted the bank. Got her out. Saturday morning, actually. How stupid. You put yourself in, get yourself out. Don't call for me to, to bail me out now. I, I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, thank God she did learn her lesson. She one time offended. I did investigate her case. I wrote some reports. I presented to the court. Because there was some issues. Uh, court did give her leniency and gave her a, not outreach, but uh, like community service and stuff, special sanctions. So it worked out. She learned her lesson. Never got in trouble again. It's going pretty well. Okay, so just think about before you want to do something stupid that could get you in jail. You don't want to be there. You really don't. It's not a good situation. This is the one I'm telling you about, the new generation. They've improved jails tremendously. Uh, doesn't mean that changes your experience, right? The fear, uh, the chances that you could be subjected to more violence in jail. That doesn't change. The only thing that changed is the exterior. It's nicer, it's cooler. I'd even say the food's a little bit better, not too much, but a little bit. And how do I know? Because I had to eat that food. <clears throat> Every meal that's served to an inmate, staff has to sample it in the dead man's tray. We have to keep it for three days. Just in case something happens to the population, they could trace the food back, test it to see if that was the source of an illness or something like that. So we always keep it for three days. Uh, it's called dead man's tray and staff sampled every single meal, and I've ate more than my share. And it's not bad. You had a lot of salt and pepper and other spices, but it's not the best. Uh, but it's enough to survive. You'll live off of it. Uh, continuous observation, both direct and indirect. The camera systems that they have now to monitor, to surveil, are so freaking awesome. You don't need to have an officer continuously monitoring the inmate population, as long as you've got cameras up. You can have one officer under control just looking at several different monitors. It's still not ideal, but it's pretty good for low level security, like in a jail. Higher level security, then you're gonna have to have direct officer observation. Yeah, that's what they're talking about, direct. Prisons, different types. Maximum, super max, medium, and minimum. Supermax sounds good. A supermax. Yeah. I just think it sounds good, especially in a Marvel movie. A supermax prison does sound good. In reality, yeah. just more security, uh, less in day movement. Uh, the cells are still the same. I would say Pelican Bay and Corcoran shoe units are probably the closest thing that would come to anything you want to call a supermax in California. Yes, sir. I was going to ask about like DXI. Who? DXI. Where's it's that? like a federal supermax. I've never worked there. I guess they have one. Well, I know just, Illinois, Marion, Illinois has one supposed to be underground and all that. I knew some of those there. They have heat sensors and stuff if you try to go in there. 
That's what I thought. Yeah. That could maybe for the fans. Yeah, because uh, I know Marion, Illinois, does have one that's kind of like underground and other types of monitoring electronics and equipment and gadgets, but the state doesn't. And like I said, I've only worked at the state, never really worked at the Fed. Um, maximum security. Restricted inmate movement. We, you could, you get single cell housing. Uh, when housing is too overcrowded, they'll go to double. Uh, they, you will never see dorms in any type of maximum security. It's always gonna be a cell structure. Whether it's a 180 design, if you remember the linear building that I drew up here, right? The cells facing out. Uh, that's better than the 270 uh, because there's still blind spots in the 270 design. But you can use the 270, they just put the walls up this way to turn them into separate little cubicle areas. And it does work pretty good. Okay, medium. Medium is still going to have a fence perimeter with arm or electric fence. Electric fence saves a lot of money. So electric fence or armed perimeter. Still restricted movement, but it's a little bit more lenient and you could have doors. Minimum, some do have uh, a perimeter fence, some don't. There are no armed security and it's primarily dorm setting. So the lower the custody level, the lower the risk, the lower the need for security. Makes sense, right? At the maximum, level four, <coughs> You would think they go by officer to population ratios. Uh, one to 12, like at a maximum, you go about one to 12, one to 18, that's about it. At a level four, still general population, the ratio is about one to 100, which is pretty damn high. One officer per 100 inmates, that's high. Uh, but they're pop, what they call them? programmers. These level fours, even though they're classified at a higher level, they program. They're there to do their time, to go to school. Normally, they're not going to cause too much trouble. That's where you can get one to 100. If these guys are in a shoe unit because they're gang affiliated or constant problems, the ratios go down. In fact, again, to about one to, no more than one to 18, I would say. I, last time I worked a shoe unit as an officer, I had 24. It was 1 to 24, but I had an S and E for backup. So it wasn't really true 1 to 24. But still, that's a lot for one officer to be responsible for that many people that are that dangerous. Maximum security, dangerous felons, strict security measures, high walls, limited contact. Security is key. Prisons are designed to eliminate hidden corners where people can <clears throat> congregate. Yeah, I think that remember. Scary things. Today's prisons, the way they're built, they would comply with it. Except maybe St. Quentin and Folsom. There's still too many blind spots in those places. But they do the best they can. Get the picture. Maximum security, envision things that you saw on TV, right? Big wire fences, uh, the, that razor wire on the top of the fences, electric fence in between, armed towers. Pretty cool. Okay, let's see what a super max is. Most predatory inmates or criminals can be independent correctional centers or locked wings of an existing prison. Lock inmates in their cell 22. Now this almost sounds like death row. Because it is on the top of North Block. And they, they're locked up most of the time. Effectiveness has achieved mixed reviews. Fear that long hours of isolation, that's public and bank. Long hours of isolation, mental health issues, absolutely true. So that's what they're calling a super max. Super max, how do you feel about these prisons? Do you believe there are situations where an offender should be locked in this type of a prison? What do we think? Think of the worst offender possible out there. The comic escapist. Okay. That would be one. <coughs> what about yeah, the Golden Gate Killer, I think they call them. Sure. Right? The Golden Gate Killer, the old man they finally found in Sacramento. Yeah, so that an officer was that? Yeah, he was an officer. Yeah. Yeah. He was an officer. He was, yeah. They finally traced him. 
through ancestry? Yeah, yeah through the ancestry, through the DNA. Some other people the DNA. One of his relatives or something. It was the weirdest case, but they finally got this guy, a serial killer. Do you think that person deserves to be locked up in something like this? Let's just see a 40 year old. At least. Yeah, no, that guy's too old. Just let him die. It's too late. 40 year old. Serial, like Richard Ramirez, the night stalker. I had him in San Quentin. Coward, biggest coward you ever met. Richard Ramirez, oh, he's a terrible person. Praise on little girls. Yeah. That's it. He's a bully. I think, speaking for the state, if you would look at it, if there's a legitimate penological interest, first of all, putting it. That's what I'm asking you. So, I don't, I don't, I don't know person. this person yeah. individually or this case individually. Anybody, right? It doesn't matter. Make up somebody. But somebody that's a killer, would that person deserve to be locked up yeah. in a place like this? Yes. Limited contact, uh, 22 hours locked up. So this year I see you shaking. Yeah, they're, they're chronic serial killers and there's yeah. sufficient objective evidence yeah. yeah, there's no doubt. There's no yeah, doubt. Killing their cellmates, they're killing their cellmates. Oh, I had one guy like that. They're abusive, whatever. Yeah. yeah, those are people that need to be in isolation for the way. Or either sent to a, a mental facility that they could melt themselves or harm themselves, and that's the only place it could be. Look up Robert Galvin, G A L V A N. Galvin. He was a bulldog for president. Uh, I think he was the last capital case that I did. Kill, because you said uh, kill a cellmate. What this guy did to his cellie, oh my goodness, tore him almost to pieces. The, 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 the body was almost unrecognizable. He used a uh, television and smashed his head into uh, repeated a bubble. A bubble? Or, yeah, the old He was afraid that this guy was out to kill him. Paranoid. <clears throat> he was paranoid. And he begged classification to give him another cell. Because he had killed his first one. This is the second time he had killed his cell. Yeah, not a good guy. His pictures, he had a YouTube thing. They did a feature on him. I worked with him for about three years as an investigator. Robert. Robert Galvin. Yeah. I remember his nickname. He had a very cool nickname. But anyway, this is the kind of person I'm talking about. There is no doubt, if you put him back out on the street, he's gonna offend, he's gonna hurt people. By his own admission, he argued in court, ineffective assistance of counsel, he wanted another attorney. The judge told him no. So we take a break, I'm talking to him in the holding cell. All right, they're just talking. For me, he wasn't a bad guy. We had a report, and he goes, no, he goes, do what I gotta do. Because I need another attorney. I can't just go do anything stupid. No, he goes, I got it. We go back in the session. The attorney goes to say something because his hands were free, they were out of the waist chains. He looks at it and just boom. Attorney goes tumbling down. I said, son of a bitch, why'd you do that to me? He said, now I can get another attorney. That's all I told the judge. And now can I have another attorney? Crazy. This guy was crazy, but he did get another attorney. Okay, so these type of people are the ones maybe should be placed in this type of confinement. The worst of the worst of the worst. Maybe, because that type of confinement is still kind of harsh. Okay, medium, medium security, uh, less secure, Houses non-violent, supposedly, provides more opportunities for contact. Uh, they don't have what's called conjugal visiting. Conjugal, meaning they can have relationships with their loved ones, preferably their wife, not a girlfriend. Uh, but yeah, they can actually have conjugal visits. Supposedly non-violent, they're in California, they're called level threes. Okay. You go one, two, three, and four. So a medium, this is about a level three institution. 
There's still a lot of security, but there's more inmate movement. Promotes greater treatment efforts, allows for more opportunity for rehabilitation, for education, and other things. When uh, I was at San Quentin, I was a sergeant, and lieutenant's list came up, and I was hireable, I was reachable. So I started looking for opportunities. Where am I going to promote? And you get offers, different prisons will call, ask if you're interested. <clears throat> and I did my homework, because I did not want to work at a level one or two institution. I wanted at least a level three or four. And so when the offer came in, it was going to be a level four GP programming institution. Take it, and that's what I'm going to do Pleasant Valley. That was the intent. You're going to have vocation, education, inmate movement. I didn't want to be locked up all the time. It sounds stupid because it's a prison but I wanted to see more movement. And so I took it, and that's what this is. It's a level three, medium security, still houses some pretty bad guys, pretty bad people, uh, but there's more movement. Minimum, these are your fire camps, your level ones, dorm settings. Uh, usually, they'll have a defined perimeter could be a line in the ground, it could be a low fence, something to say, hey, this is the boundary. Not armed, not electrified, not set. It's just to let people know. Sometimes it'll be a sign. It just says out of bounds. In other words, it just don't go on this side of that line. That's all minimum is. You really don't get an escape, a true escape, out of a level one. They're called walkaways. An escape means there's an effort, you know, you kind of cut through a wall just over some fences. So at a level one, we kind of just call them a walk away. Because that's all they have to do, just keep going. Pass that little line in the sand and keep walking. So what keeps them from doing that? What do we think? Why would they just not leave? Yeah, and they'll never see level one again. They're not saying about the food conditions. They're not that good. The food's better at level one. It is always better. There's more uh, opportunities for inmates, for jobs, for visiting. They're just, it's a lot nicer place to be. If you gotta be locked up, that's where you wanna go. If you wanna be in a level one. So the fear of losing that for life keeps them pretty much at bay, keeps them from walking away. Uh, greater deal of personal freedom, criticized for being like country clubs. Uh, I've never seen one that was like a country club. The feds, you know about the feds? They have one in the Martinez Venetia that is a federally operated, they have a golf course. Yeah. That one is like white collar criminals go there. It's awesome, it's a really cool prison. <clears throat> I've only been to the front of it, I never got to walk and tour the whole thing. You could tell. Carpeting, I mean, this thing is just something else. State prisons where I was at the level ones, they're okay. They're not bad, a little more freedom. Uh, that's about it, not really a country club. Feds, yeah. Alternative, okay, something other than just locking somebody up. The shock incarceration boot camps. The state that I'm familiar with, I don't think I've ever seen a boot camp at the state level. I've seen them at the county level, and they were for juveniles, and it works really well. We get offenders that are at risk of becoming a habitual criminal, or are already a habitual criminal as a juvenile. Send them to boot camp, it's paramilitary. They're in uniform, they march, they drill, they raise the flag every night, or every morning, and lower it at night. And they do really well. Uh, their success rates are pretty good. At just about any county that has a boot camp. But there's just not enough to go around. Community Correctional Facilities, or RTCs, Return to Custody Facilities. They are operated by the community and overseen by the state of California. Good question. Um, yes, it's just a boot camp. If they're programmers, like I was telling you, they go to work or school or something like that, yes. Uh, 
Uh, usually about 6.30, we start waking up, start making noise, getting people stirred up. About 6.40, 6.45, we start running up the chow. Okay, it's feeding time. It takes about an hour and 15 minutes to feed. At that time, it was about 1,100 inmates. Not bad. We have two dining halls on my yard. We would run them through and pick up their trays. I could talk all day about how feeding works, but we get them through the chow halls, back to their units, and lock them up. Then we clear the yard, clear the dining rooms, make sure everybody's where they're supposed to be, then we release, the work's going on. That's usually about eight o'clock. About eight o'clock, we make the call, and we'll tell them, release building one, release building two, and we let their workers out. Once they're where they're supposed to be, you clear the yard again. Check your units, make sure everybody's alive and breathing. Then you release for yard, recreation. Usually 8.30, quarter to nine. Open up the yard, let them come out. They can go to the store, the canteen windows there. Uh, socialize with their friends, play basketball, play volleyball, play horseshoes, soccer, whatever they want to do. Get your picture there. Like this. <laughs> it's the life of an inmate, leisure. If they're working at night, they get the whole day to program. Have fun, go to the library, whatever they want to do. Uh, call them back in for lunchtime. They pick up a sack lunch at breakfast. So after they pick up their meal, they eat. As they're walking out, there's a bin full of lunches. They pick one and go. The officer sits and monitors, make sure they just take one. But that's their lunch. And in the afternoon, we release again for yard program. 3.30, everybody comes back in from books and education, lock them up. About 4.15, we do security checks and count time. They're released for dinner. Get them up for dinner, bring them back, lock them up. The security check, release for evening program, religious services, there are all kinds of different things going on. Good morning, sir. So there, that's about a day, a regular day in about a level three or level four GP. A lot of movement, as you can tell. Uh, there's a lot of movement going on. We're talking hundreds of inmates on any given yard. Community correctional facilities. These are lower level custody inmates, level ones, maybe even a two in there. The facility is staffed. I don't want to say a reddit top, but really that's about what they amount to. Uh, these are officers that are trying to get their foot in the door into the sheriff's department or the state corrections. So it's an opportunity. They'll work at a return to custody facility. The inmate population is those who've been violated on parole, and the state really doesn't want them, so they contract with a private vendor who operate these community correctional facilities. Delano has a real nice one, that's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, and then of course, private prisons. General Electric is the big one that I'm familiar with. Uh, Adelanto, has anybody ever been over on the 15, cut across on the 58 through Adelanto? It's a town out there. It's Spiria, just before Spiria. Does that sound familiar? If you're ever going to Bakersfield, the valley, and you go through the desert, if you go to Adelanto, if you look towards the, in the south, they call that prison valley. They got federal prisons and they got private prisons. As, got as far as I can see, they're just scattered. All over. Private prisons are operated for profit. Okay, these are corporations that build these prisons and contract with the state for a certain amount of money to house an offender in their prison. They provide the food, they provide the security, they provide everything that a person needs. However, <coughs> they're still overseen by CDC, Department of Corrections. Questions about these types of operations? That's a lot of information. Okay, alternative, prison farms, camps. Primarily in the south and in the west of the United States, been in operation since the 19th century. Alternative correctional institutions. In the state of California, we do not have a prison farm. We do have camps. They're called fire camps. I was at a couple. Uh, baseline camp is above like Sonora, if you know where Sonora is at. Nice little camp up in the mountains. What makes this camp so unique, we had inmate firefighters, remember I told you I was a firefighter at that time, so I go to the camp as a sergeant, yeah, I was a sergeant at the time, and if we got a fire, 
we would respond with the inmate labor with the Department of Forestry to the fire pit, to the site, the actual site of the fire. The inmates would go to work, and usually I would stay back and just wait to sleep sometimes. CDF had control of the inmates while they were working, not CDC. Okay, once they were done, they bring them back, now they're ours. We make sure they get fed, tend to medical needs, make sure they're accounted for, and they have some place to get some rest. Really, really cool operation. Baseline of camp I'm telling you about was unique because we had a strike team that used a helicopter. Not bad. They were called the hot spot. We put them up in the helicopter, take them over the fire, and let them repel down. No, I never got to do that. <coughs> they trained. I did repel, but I never got to drop down into a hot spot. It's pretty damn cool. If you're an inmate, you're making good money, riding around in a helicopter, and the food is awesome at camp. That I can attest to. I'm talking steak and lobster. Yeah, you know, the weekends. Yeah, it's so cool. I, I love camps, so I'll tell you real quick. I was at Green Valley Conservation Camp as a lieutenant, so I'm a camp commander. My team would go out, I would go to the kitchen, I'd come back. CDF, Department of Forestry, would write us checks, actual check, thousands of dollars in checks for food. But we took our own food to the fire camp. So when we got back, I got to go shopping, right? I got to go shopping with thousands, take a couple of inmates with me, let's go, grab some carts, go down to Ralph's. What are we buying? Fresh vegetables, number one, steaks. Uh, we had salmon, because we used to do the salmon run. But we would buy all thousands of dollars of food, bring them back, put them in our shelves, and then enjoy it. It was cool on the redemptive nature with this. A lot of fire departments, when they work with these inmates, they allow a lot of opportunities for the inmates because they're already close to the lease yep. to be a, become part of their department. So they transition right out. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what I really like about yep. this. Program. Yeah, it's a win-win. Because uh, they do, they've got all this experience, the inmate firefighters. They transition right into a non-sworn firefighting position somewhere. So it's a win-win for everybody. But wow, what an experience that was. Okay, so for the state, we do have camps, but we don't have a prison for it. Alternative correctional institutions, uh, back to the boot camps, shock incarceration. This confuses a lot of people because it does pop up on your quiz. What is shock incarceration? short-term correctional program based on a boot camp approach that makes use of military-like regiment, high-intensity physical training. That is what they call shock incarceration. We scare the crap out of them. We shock them into reality. Mil paramilitary, they get dead in their face like a drill sergeant does, scares the heck out of these offenders. Boot camps, a short-term militaristic correctional facility, inmates undergo, Intensive physical conditioning discipline. It works. These two programs, highly successful. If, and I'm just guessing at numbers right now, okay? But if the recidivist rate, say in the state of California, is about at 60%. So if somebody offends, the likelihood of them coming back is 60%. If they go through either of these programs, it drops, drops down to maybe 15%. That's huge. We're not talking a small return, huge return. Uh, back to the correctional facilities. Uh, the attempt by correctional agency to maintain convicted offenders in the community rather than in a prison. Includes probation, parole, residential programs. And then the halfway house, community-based, houses inmates before their outright release so they can become gradually acclimated to conventional society. That's just getting them ready. Getting them ready for release. I dealt with people, offenders, that have spent the better part of their lives in prison, 20 plus years. They get a parole date. Their biggest fear, what am I gonna do when I get out? So you sit down with them. These people have to apply for driver's license. So we, call, we have a class called pre-release, where they go through and try to get these people acclimated to what life's gonna be like on the outside. They were locked up, say, 1980. 2000, now they're getting out. 
think of the dramatic changes in society in 20 years. When they were locked up, VCR was state-of-the-art technology. Yeah, and now we got, what's it called, USB drives, flash drives? What the hell is that? Cars have changed drastically. Uh, I remember one person specifically, we we're talking to him about filling out, uh, completing a resume for a job. Didn't know what a resume meant, had no clue. So we had to show him separately. And I was just there as a guest observer. The uh, class was taught by education people. I'm just there watching them, and I remember this kid he looked at them, and the kid was already older, had no clue what a resume was. No clue what they're going to do with the rest of their life. Think about that, how scary that is. I know somebody that's been in there since 1980. He's been 16 years old when he got locked up. Yeah. Three, four years ago, I'm on the computer. He does law, I do law. I'm telling him, close the window, close the window. He's not it's getting not the window. Window. And then I don't get it. He doesn't even realize there's an X up there to close the window. Yeah. It's not just one thing. But imagine all the changes that have happened in 20 years. Now this is another older guy. He was already in his 60s. A lifer, he worked in prison industry, very respected by the younger inmate population. They tend to respect the uh, older people. And uh, he was up for parole. And so I was talking to him, I'm here, I'm great, I'm sitting out, watching them do their thing. And uh, he comes and sits by me on the bench. And what's on your mind? Start my, it's called S time. <clears throat> and I start S time in the next week. S time is the time that it takes to get their records closed out. So, yeah, for 10 days, they don't go to work, they just stay in their cells and get ready to be discharged for parole. He goes, I parole, and I start S time next week. And uh, I go, Good. I go, yeah, good. You're anxious to see your family finally. They start crying. He goes, I got nobody. He goes, Everybody I ever knew is dead. Anyone I ever loved disowns me. Because I have nothing. Well, where are you going to go? Because while I'm paroling, he's going to the Bay Area, Alameda County, I think. He gets his gate money. That's $200. $200, that's it. That hasn't changed. He gets his gate money. And so what are you going to do with that? Well, he goes, well, I figured it. He goes, I'm going to get laid. He goes, I'm going to get drunk. He goes, and I'm going to rob a store. He goes, and I'm trying to get back to soon as I can. That was his plan. He spent all his life in prison, and his goal was to come back, the sooner the better. That's sad, okay? but that's what prison does to some people. Halfway houses, uh, it is what it is. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. It's an option other than sending somebody to jail or to prison. A lot of the times, halfway houses, you either have to sponsor yourself and pay your way through or get somebody to sponsor you pay for it. Sometimes the state will, most of the time it. Private prisons, I kind of spoke about it. Here's one, Corporation of America. About 415 private prisons in the uh, United States. Little sound evidence that private prisons are cheaper or produce better results. It's too new, they haven't had enough time to research it. And some state governments still view private prisons as a low-cost alternative. California did for a little while, and we got away from it. But that's what they look like. Correction Corporation of America. Big industry. Oh, good, because I was just going to ask you this. Do you support or oppose the idea of a private prison? Think about it. Private prisons are for profit. Should a corporation be allowed to profit by housing convicted uh, felons? Their worst time in their life, they're in misery for the most part. And 
we have private companies profiting from that misery. That's kind of how I look at it. It means what you think. Um, I'm just saying no, it just feels like private companies holding their own prisons. Yeah. Like women can wait and stuff. That just doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem right, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you think there'd be a tendency to cut corners to increase profit? Right? Yeah. That's the first thing I think of. I'm in charge of a private prison. I want to make more money. Where can I cut corners? It's not going to be the staffing. Medical need. I'm going to get a doctor as cheap as I can. Well, the state does that. Anyway, I'm going to try to cut corners wherever I can. So it's kind of a sour apple. And there is no proof that they are actually doing a good job. We gotta just wait and see. It's one of those things we're just monitoring and seeing if it's going to uh, be worth the investment. I think at minimum, understanding their nature, their corporation, corporations' key interest is their shareholders, mm -hmm. and that's it. That's it. And that's where the dilemma lies. Their interest isn't in caring for these people that are locked up under their care. It isn't. It's to the shareholders. And if you're invested in that company, wouldn't you agree with that? Think about it. You're a stockholder in this company. And here, this manager is spending money on providing better quality food for the inmate population, dipping into your profit. How are you going to feel about that? Yeah, you're out of here. We're going to put somebody in there that isn't afraid to cut corners. So yeah, it's kind of, the jury's still out on this one. Uh, populations, disproportionately young, uh, also disproportionately male, tend to be more minority, and low income. Future trends, rate of increase has slowed, that's true. Budget cutbacks may halt the expansion of prison construction, cause the housing of even more prisoners in already crowded prison facilities. That's already happened. We've closed two prisons in the state of California in the last, I don't know, five, six years. More on the chopping block. What was double cell and dorm living is gone. They're all single cell now. But what's in store for the future? Nobody knows. When I started with the state, there was 12, well, Two state prisons, also St. Quentin. Ten institutions, what they call institutions. So a total of 12. By the time I retired, there was 32. I came in right as the trend was going through the world. Three strikes hit. Uh, they changed from determinate, from indeterminate to determinate sentencing. That caused a huge influx in the population. Caused problems. Now we're on the other side of that slope. Things are coming down. Do we have any questions about this presentation? <laughs>